hot sound guy just texted me. I'm not a take to the bed type. Now she's got COVID? That's very off trend for her. Hi, everyone. This is And Just Like That, The Writer's Room, the official companion podcast from Max. I'm Michael Patrick King, writer, director, and executive producer of And Just Like That. Here with me is executive producer and writer Julie Rottenberg. Hi. And executive producer and writer Elisa Zaritsky. Hello. And consulting producer, writer Susan Fails Hill. Bonjour. Oh, she's French today. <laughs> Here we go. Today, we get to discuss episode number three, which is called Chapter Three. This is written by Julie Rottenberg and Elisa Zaritsky. And last year you wrote the third episode. And I remember a lot of nail biting over it for some reason. What Why? is it about number three? Why? Why I, was hoping, I was hoping somebody <laughs> would have the answer because I think it's I, that what the is it? first one, we're back. We spend a lot of time like Resetting what are we doing table. this season? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're we're rocket ship launched. The second one, we're kind of finishing the meal that we have started serving in the first one. I think it's that in the third, we're, we're sort of between the first act and the rest of the mm. production. The interesting thing about the third episode is it's kind of like the proof of the pudding. It's kind of like the motor. It's kind of like the first two were like a little bit of a fireworks display. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is like, here we go. And last year we cracked it with the Natasha storyline. And we it was a nice combination of fast and farce farcical. Mm -hmm. And this third episode called chapter three, which refers to the third chapter in Carrie's sad memoir about the death of Big. And if you haven't seen the third episode, chapter three yet. Please uh, stop listening to us. You might enjoy it more if you know what we're talking about and go watch it. And if you've just come back, welcome back to chapter <laughs> three. But this is different because this episode is the one episode up front that we wanted to deal with the loss. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to pretend that season two, everything's great. It's just going to be fun, fun, met balls and pretty clothes. But it was hard. It was definitely it was hard, very because, hard because we also felt the at least I will say I felt pressure to make sure it was still funny. Alisa, you, you feel a lot of pressure all the time. But I do. why particularly do you feel <laughs> pressure about this? <laughs> pressure to make the sad wound funny. Um, well, that's what we do, right? Yes. Because look, people are tuning into our show to be entertained, to have some escapism, to get away from their own whatever is bumming them out. They are looking to us to sort of lift them out of it. So how do you lift them out while while showing that the our heroine is still not quite over this big I, loss? I think you had the hardest task with this episode because it's such an emotional anchor. And it's always difficult to dramatize grief. We also wanted to be true to the reality of someone who's lost a spouse, which is it's not a straight line from grief to release and acceptance. Based on women that we know and people that we know who have lost a spouse or a partner, it's an ongoing journey. And in and fiction... And sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. So... We felt that we wouldn't be doing justice to the reality of the situation if we just had Carrie off and flying and going from having sex with Franklin to her professional, fun, everything that's left in the season that you will all enjoy. And we knew it, we wanted to do it around this episode, but we also wanted to find a way to do it without her being in bed the whole time. At right. We definitely didn't want was... to have her in bed. And as a matter of fact, at the end of the episode, she says, I'm not the type of person who takes to my bed. And then, of course, she does with Lisette, which we'll get to. Right. But the fact of the matter is Carrie Bradshaw was destroyed and is moving through life nobly. And because we're writers, what we do when something bad happens, correct, Susan? Yes, absolutely. We write it. 
We mm-hmm. turn it into something else. We try to change it into a product. I mean, it's. I feel bad for people that don't write because when something bad right. happens, they just have to you sit there. With yeah, it. we have an automatic catharsis through our writing, but often we try to make it funny, as they were saying, well, as as Elisa. Because the and, sad is yes. sad. It's so. exactly. too hard to well, live. It's too, yeah. too hard to live yeah. with. And just here we had to actually it. be comfortable exactly sitting in that pain. And the great thing about it is Carrie's a writer. That's not a surprise because mm-hmm. that's our what we do. So we knew that Carrie had written a book and we thought, okay, for this season, if you write a book, you have to go down the press junket with it. And one of the things we love about Carrie, even in the first season of In Just Like That, is she doesn't parade her grief. She almost doesn't want to take up too much time with it. It was all private last season, like a lot of her by herself because she didn't want to drag her friends through it, which is what this episode winds up being about, the second chapter of that. But the fun thing about it is how do we get her to deal with it? So she has to record her book. And the fun thing about that is she hasn't really dealt with it. And now she's going to be dealing with it in a public arena with witnesses and I will say, and this was one of these episodes where we we went in there, we thought we understood the story, we broke it down, we started writing it, and we kept hitting a wall around getting her from the recording of the book to having this breakdown, taking to her bed, um eventually lying to her friends. And it was you who at a certain point realized- Michael. You, you Michael, <laughs> sorry, you can't see me t- pointing to Michael. Um, you figured it out. When they're at that lunch and Charlotte says to Carrie, how's the book going? We're all so impressed at how well you're doing. And that is the thing that, it's almost like saying that thing, the centipede thinking about how am I walking with all these hundred legs that breaks her. For the first time, maybe in the series, she lies to her friends. She doesn't talk about a conversation that you would normally have at the coffee shop in Sex and the City, which mm-hmm. is where she says, you know what I'm feeling, still feel bad. And she doesn't mm-hmm. feel she can. She has and a that, little shame about that. That was really hard for me. I had a lot of trouble getting to that, to use the word now, you've made me realize. I say a lot earning that because to lie, to lie, let's say, to Elisa. Elisa and Julia are best friends since <laughs> high school, since no, grade, younger, school. grade school. Nine, nine. Nine years old. So. I often think like, wow, like what would I keep from Elisa? What helped me get there eventually was this idea of her feeling like she'd been a drain to her friends mm-hmm. and that she'd already, she'd used up her... Her chits. Right, her, right. Her, her a get lot out of, Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that helped. And also it was a way for us to show Seema, who last year, as you may recall, in episode four, Carrie feels is very thoughtless in response to Carrie's pain. When she breaks the photograph. When she breaks the photograph. And now we felt like this is an opportunity to have Seema, who wasn't there the first time around, be there for her and and cement that bond. Also, and them. go from new friends, you know, it new friends friendship. to real yeah. friends. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the other thing that them. I think was a trap was giving, I'm going to say giving uh, Julie and Elisa permission to not write a funny book scene in the recording studio. I mean, literally, we had to force you <sighs> to not write the, well, the, there was a version wait, that... what do you mean? There, you know, yeah. you, the first version of this was very much like Carrie being like, I wouldn't say fumfering in the recording oh, studio right. and, and there was and all the comedy. Other, right, and right. I kept going, no, it's about the pain. It's about the pain. And then when you yeah. finally handed in the draft that we shot, I directed this episode, Michael, and uh, <laughs> there was a line that you wrote, and this is an interesting thing, what writing can do to a director. There was a line you wrote which is something that you don't usually write on this show. When Carrie looks down at the the book, it says, it seems to her as though the words are blurring on the page. That's a stage direction. And I went, well, let's really 
go in her head, since you as writers already went inside her head rather than, you know, picturing it in an outside place. You were already in there. And then I decided, well, let's go really surreal. Let's have the walls close in on her. Which we never let's do. Let's take like, all the sound such a away. Idea. Let's really let's, go inside. And the graphics And the of graphics the words. of the words spinning. It's a very big step out for, mm -hmm. which is a naturalistic show. But mm -hmm. when the writing, when you took it there finally to the place of she's dissociating yes. or, or out of her mind, out of her body, out of her body, really. Mm -hmm. Then I could bring in the shower sounds. And that's the actual shower from the mm. big dying. Wow. That's the same mm. soundtrack. The music that's playing under there is the same music from last season's Discovering Big Dead. So to me, it was really fun to get into the wound knowing that we had this ridiculous left turn out of it by it's, having it, Carrie pretend to have COVID. Right. But, and that discovery, because I, I remember even, even perhaps after the first draft, it took a while for us to land on the COVID, the fake yeah. COVID, because we spent the entire, well, this, the, we spent the entire season one mostly ignoring, COVID. except for one, 100%. one or two references in the in the right, premiere, in the past um, but that was a revelation because that suddenly felt funny to us, and I believe it was Michael's idea. To, I, I, <laughs> I think it was the because we were realizing we, it was the get out of jail free card. It's a get out yes. of jail free card. Well, now I feel bad about lying to my publisher, and worse about lying to my two oldest friends. You know, but they've already been so there for me. You know, I just can't put them through more of this. I mean, there's got to be like a, an expiration date on how much grief you can ask a friend to support. Well, not if they're true friends. <laughs> I wasn't there for the first round, but I am now. I'm all ears. I hate feeling sorry for myself. Also, the nobility of Carrie in this storyline, her impatience with herself that's so poignant, that she feels like she should be over it, and she's calling upon this strength, and yet we're all feeling for her. Which I, I, it's one of the things that I love about writing for this show is that, you know, in addition to finding, to getting to, getting to know the new characters better this season, there's still stones mm. to turn over with the old characters. Like, we didn't know until Carrie became a widow what kind of griever she would be. Mm -hmm. But you sort of, it fills in for you. Oh, she doesn't want to sit around. She doesn't want to dwell. She keeps her feet moving. She's and not a self-pitying. And then yeah. in the machinery of writing, we know, like, as Julie has said, we've sat dangerously in sadness for the viewer. So then it's like, okay, how do we, what's the smelling salts? How do we get them back? <laughs> <laughs> on Carrie Bradshaw, shoes. So the next thing that happens is she busts in the door in a very, very Sex in the City montage with way too many very shoes. over the top. I mean, like 70 pairs of it's shoes. A shoe oh. it's, it's a shoe orgy. It's a shoe orgy. It, it is a shoe orgy. On, by design, it's a shoe orgy. <laughs> and still, it doesn't quite get her to the place when she picks up the book to try to read again. And she has to say... I, I lifted his dead body, and she's like, nope. And then she calls from the middle of her thing, seeing that character, Jimmy, with the mask on. And that went in her subconscious, and then she thought, oh, I'll get out of it this way by doing COVID. Doing COVID. I, I want to point out, just for our listeners, that how many iterations things go through Originally, that scene was set at Bergdorf's. I know. <laughs> That's I know. true. We're trying for that That's discount true. from Bergdorf's, good men, <laughs> but it didn't work out. No, it's much better. It was, yeah. I mean, it always starts and then moves into where it needs to be. But the idea of Carrie coming home alone with all those shoes. And, and by the way, I was directing it and Sarah Jessica was like, yeah, she's keeping three. And I said, what? Said, yeah, she's sending back 57 boxes. <laughs> she's keeping three. Oh, I love that. She just like got a random, yeah. like, fill it up. 
And right. then she's going to send them all back. <laughs> I'm going to test drive them at I'm home. I'm going to test them. And, and some of those shoes, by the way, I edited the show so that you mm. can see as many shoes as possible, including the deflated red balloon <laughs> oh, yeah. shoe, yeah. which is balloon. on every runway right now. And it was like we were the first to put the deflated red balloon yeah, shoe on. And I had to manipulate when... it so people could see it going on her oh, foot. Yeah. Right. You saw her going, what the hell is but, this? But, you know, things are important to people. And in a bad time or to fill a hole, things become even more important. And that's the Seema story. The Seema gets her purse robbed. Mm -hmm. And that birth of that story was New York's crime was up, but it happened to be up when we started writing. That low-life motherfucker. Uh, can you be more specific? Someone just stole my Birkin. No, where? Right in front of my goddamn townhouse, like in broad daylight. What's happening to the city? One day when we were coming to the set, uh, Julie, you had actually just seen a robbery on Madison Avenue, two men Literally, making off with, with a, packages, a, right? A delivery, a UPS guy's boxes, like right in front of my face. We were shooting blocks away. Um, and it was a chance for us, we who live in New York, and I'm going to include Michael in no. that, even though he's, you know, technically bi-coastal, but his heart is in New York, um, the complicated relationship we all have with New York, which is it's really stressful and expensive and in moments filled with crime and unexpected, possibly scary situations, but we love it. And it's part of why we love yeah. it, maybe, because it's so, so challenging. Can we point out that it's not just any purse? It it's is a the sacred Birkin, it's which a Birkin. Thank and, enshrined and, and, in the original series. I like your how did you pronounce Birkin? Birkin. Be I thought you said Birkin. No. <laughs> no. no. I did not Birkin. say Birkin, Elisa. <laughs> Elisa. I said Birkin. But here's, can I point out that when we wrote Birkin, Molly Rogers, the brilliant forward-thinking designer, said, no, it can't be a Birkin. That's not happening now. <laughs> Can it be something newer? And mm, I said, no. That's the point. That, and then we wrote that line about, I've had it so long there wasn't even a list, yes. a wait list. Mm -hmm. But it was a Birkin. We did reference it. Samantha stole Lucy Liu's Birkin in the series. Right, mm. right. And this is a- it's, it's sort of an old friend. Yeah. And when yeah. you see <laughs> on first dibs, when you see Simo mourning and grieving and taking to her bed and crying about it, you see how much that costs and you're like, oh, that is a loss. And it isn't just about what it cost, it's what it represents. It because it was the first, her, first, her success. Her yes. first success. Yes. So. And it's something that she valued, that she lost. And the whole thing is basically there so she could say to Carrie, I was in a fetal position over a Birkin. Not that I'm equating the two. <laughs> and she but goes, you, you kind of are. are. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the fun of having Seema have a, an attachment to a thing. And really go for the grief. And, and and also to show Carrie being as generous as she is in that moment where she says, no, you're allowed to be yes, upset. Yes, it meant something It to meant you. something. Right, right. And the episode really starts with Carrie walking past a jewelry show being set up that's Lisette, her downstairs neighbor. I mean, there's so much that goes into writing, but like the first thing was like, Reminding the audience who Lisette was. So the writer's challenge is like, how do you remind the audience who've seen Lisette maybe t once or twice? Once Last maybe. Season. And she was basically yeah. crying in her hall. Mm -hmm. How do you remind them who the character is immediately? And Julie and Elisa came up with that line I thought you only existed in the vestibule <laughs> of our building, which, you know. <laughs> Look, that is the most artistic it is. exposition. Okay. Carrie comes across Lisette in Bryant Park, where she is watching very sweetly, watching the workmen set up the diamond tents for her Bulgari designer show. She's one of the three designers to watch. We wanted to remind the audience that she was a designer, and we wanted to show her a little bit embarrassed about the fact that she was young enough and happy enough and excited enough to see them set it up. So she asks Carrie to come. And in friendship, Carrie does go, even though she's feeling bad, because friends are important to Carrie and new friends, and she knows how much it means. So she takes herself out of her grief and goes to the uh, jewelry opening. Jewelry opening. And of course, Bryant Park is the home to Fashion Week, and it's kind of fun. Well, it though. was the home to Fashion yeah. Week back when the Birkin was a thing. Yeah. I mean, it, and now we actually film there, which is really exciting. Lisette's important because she represents, to me in the show, she represents the journey to come 
mm. and carries on the journey that was and mm-hmm. what doesn't know what her journey to come is. But the idea of somebody just starting out and Carrie reflecting that loss so well and then Lizette saying to her... Um, I have to start all over again. It was perfect yeah. and I have to start all over again. And then Carrie says, I hear I see how you, I know how you feel. Well, and then another great moment of grace because it's the grief of a child really over her jewels that have been stolen versus the real Well, it's all about the thing that you love and that you worked hard at. And Lisette worked, as Carrie says at the show, I was always wondering what she was doing down there. But she worked really hard Mm -hmm. to make that jewelry and to have it just ripped away from her, literally. And, you know... Seema worked really hard to get the money for that Birkin to have it ripped away. Mm -hmm. And Carrie worked really hard at that relationship to have it ripped away. So they're all deeply connected. And Mm -hmm. what's fun about it is they're one of the original characters and two of the new characters, and they're all knit into this theme together. Mm -hmm. And we have our two other original characters sort of on their own tracks. You have, you know... Charlotte and LTW having a milk <laughs> very serious <laughs> on a story. Very, a very important, a very important episode of and just Felt like, like that. We had to balance the nutritional <laughs> elements of the meal the grief. of the show. Sure. With the grief with I mean, the Elisa, some talk, yes. candy. Talk a little bit about why we did MILF and but the context of MILF. It's not about MILF. That's like 1990s. Well, I but mean, what did we do with this story? I will say that. I and I've I've only been a parent in this age, so I can't compare right. it to other eras of parenting. But I will say that as a parent of kids in private schools in New York, and from what I hear from other people who are in private school settings, there is a justifiably earnest tenor where everybody's dealing with very serious issues in the world and in our society. And our schools are feeling a lot of pressure to message correctly and be perfect and be conscious and be sensitive and be everything, be equitable. And all of this pressure has come down on schools. And so sometimes, occasionally it's kind of funny what (laughs) we get from our schools. So how could we address that and send that up in a way that isn't offensive or making light of serious situations. And I believe it was Susan who came up with the MILF list, which to me was just a bullseye for something funny and I think harmless. Someone out there might <laughs> might feel differently. No, no. What's great but... about the MILF list, it, it's a perfect example of an understandable, not hot button topic that's treated as though it is because the administration of this school is so hyper aware of doing everything correct that they overcorrect on a MILF list. Right. And also because our two characters are irreverent in like, we're going to get the list. Yes. And that they're number two and three. And how um, embarrassingly giddy they are when they discover that. And by the way, I just want to say, as the parent of a, a kids in public schools, that it exists there too. Like yes. this, this over... Cautious, yep. yes. wanting to communicate to the Every, parents yes. a and certain ethos. We want to. The they want to right the wrongs. It, it comes from a great place. It but does it's, come from a place sometimes of it's kindness, funny. but sometimes and then, and then you it's get an, very sad to write. Then you the get an actor like Tim Bagley to play Greg, oh who is like so pointed in his comic By the energy. Way, can we talk and about also, the other fun thing about this little storyline is the rest of the Zoom mommies are in it. The uh, the 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 Charlotte um, LTW the little crew from the last little crew year. from last yeah. year as, as well. But our course correction from the writing room was at the lunch scene when the MILF list was opened and they squeal and then you have Carrie and Naya being not on board with it. Be- and then Naya even says, shouldn't we be talking about more important things? And this moment at the lunch was sort of an important inflection point, I think, for us, because we hopefully have earned the right to have our new characters come out to lunch with their old characters and not make it a thing. It was not an event. You saw LTW and Naya racing from the, mm-hmm. the but recording. But that was really fun. Well, that, that idea of 
you know, Naya being in LTW's documentary, that was a fun little well, discovery. That once it was again, all, the, mm-hmm. t- the, the thread that connects the, the, all these yeah, characters, the very how, can we make, mm-hmm. how can we make them out of their own runways into just one big Right, mm-hmm. and march. she's interviewing Naya, whom Charlotte introduced her to, yes. because Naya is a professor of law, and one of the people in her uh, documentary is Constance Baker Motley, who was a big inspiration to Katanji Brown Jackson. And I love the irreverence and the giddiness and then the gravitas of these women in this show. Well, it's that same thing. Like, you're going to take a very big, strong stand and then you're going to get hit by a cream pie and say, I'm not all that important. And that did with the the text guy during the interview with with LTW. Naya sort of is for the first time. The (laughs) the scales have fallen from her married lady (laughs) eyes. And she sees a guy with good arms and a shirt. And and LTW goes, yeah, he's fine. (laughs) And and so, I'm, not, I'm just separated, so I'm not thinking that. I think you are. <laughs> I think you are thinking that. So it's a way of saying the pilot light's lit, here we go, and you take this very principled, very smart intellectual Cerebral, character who is yeah. a little bit above the MILF thing, and in the next beat, she's like, the sound guy texted me, and Squealing. then her and LTW <laughs> squeal. <laughs> So it's all really the fun of it for us is constantly playing with the idea of society, where we are, who these characters are in reaction to society. And showing and different sides of their character. And you know, that their these women don't take themselves yeah. too seriously. But also that, that they would be a little self-conscious with Naya there when Charlotte says, I promise you our, our <laughs> lunchtime but, fodder isn't always this lowbrow. And, and Carrie says, who have you been there? dying with? <laughs> right. So it's a way of saying like, guys, come on, be on, be on your right. best behavior. Right. But giving women the freedom that you can be this brilliant yes, intellectual yes. and at the same time be Giddy. delighted You're still when a, a little girl sometimes. Yes. You. Yeah, exactly. it's great. And the other thing that's great about the LTW saying, just speaking of exposition, the idea back in the first uh, classroom scene, school scene, uh, when she says, what does Miranda like? Is she a mm. nut person or a flower person? And Charlotte says... Well, she's still in L.A. I'll give you the number, which gets us to Miranda, who is now in the third section, Act 3, <laughs> Chapter 3, Part 3 of her honeymoon. The idyllic getaway and, to L.A. Uh, what's fun about this to me is that it's now we're able to start to really focus on what Che's show is, what that life is. And how what their problem is with mm-hmm. it. Yeah, you know, and how is... much pressure they're under. And it starts with, a, a, I think, a really funny scene that Julie and Elisa wrote about Che doing their lines with Miranda and Miranda constantly reminding Che that they have to cry in the scene. <laughs> and Che says, no, I don't have to cry. It's not important. And then it's just, it says, you cry, you cry, you cry, you cry. And to me, what I love about that is someone who is not in the business, not theatrical, <laughs> n- a lawyer reading a contract and saying to the artist, you have to cry now. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Well, also, Cynthia is is such a good actor. She could play Miranda, not a terrible actor, but just right. Um, oh, she knew how to play bad acting. Yeah. She, was <laughs> she was having she was having a lot of, lot of fun little with that. Cannoli. <laughs> but, it, but if you look at the 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 beautiful panorama scene of this beautiful little bungalow, and there's they're having uh, blood orange juice, and it's this idyllic couple rather than like they're both on a soapbox or they're both you know crying. It's just like here's this day, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere. Che doesn't want to say a certain line because it represents a part of the non-binary experience that they do not want to reflect as truthful, which is that they're not happy. And it's that thing of here's a version of you that somebody is telling you or slash more important, paying you to be and the struggle, Mm -hmm. you know, which is very profound for Che, but they're trapped. They have to do it. It's Hollywood, it's TV, it's their big break, coupled with the the nonsensical problem that Miranda's having with her new Android phone because she lost her iPhone on the beach. So now she has a phone that she can't really control, which is important for the plot. 
I mean, Miranda has a lot going on in this episode. We somehow managed to get the tattoo in there and the Brady call. Well, talk about what the tattoo means, first of all, Lisa. Well, we talked. This was something that was floating through, I think, a number of our minds about in between the seasons. Like, as we think of the characters as real women, I know several of my friends who late in life, in their 40s and 50s, getting tattoos, it's become so um, common and commonplace, I should say, to to do it. And so it had floated through my head like someone should. It suddenly seemed like a perfect thing for Miranda to to do it. Like more and more as we talked about it, it seemed like yeah, well, she ha- definitely well, would do it. First because, of all, Che has it. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. And also Absolutely. in LA, oh my God. I mean, it's I guess comic too. Everybody. But it's right. also marking this huge transition yeah. in her life. Yeah. That she's morphing from one thing to another. And we spent a lot of time debating what the tattoo okay. should be. I was just gonna say yes. <laughs> when we, we were sent, when we were sent off to script, we hadn't nailed it down. We were talking maybe something about a robot. And uh, Elise and I had had cut the outline in half. Elisa took one half. I took the other half. I was writing the tattoo thing, and I was thinking, like, I don't know, a robot? That I just can't see it. But I didn't know what would be I think be you're understanding better. now that Julie puts a lot of herself <laughs> on trial as a writer. Julie's very, well, very in trial constantly. I mean, I mean, Surely it, we all do. We have right? stress and we Is have trauma. Right? When I take off my shirt, you see a um, giant robot tattoo on my back. <laughs> all right. But we anyway, have to explain what the robot represented, okay. so Joy. So the robot was hearkening back to last season's episode three, in which Miranda is leaving the big um, Netflix, Netflix special. special with Carrie and Charlotte and decides she's going to sneak back in and actually see Che and says, like, I decided... Why am I just going right back home? Am I a little robot? Um, And that that was sort of a liberating thing for her and that maybe the robot would represent what she doesn't want to do. But anyway, I just remember I was- Welcome to writing. Yeah. So (laughs) writing is rewriting. circling and circling and circling it. And then I remember, Elise, I sent you, I think it was probably a text. And I was like, I'm wrestling with this tattoo. Would it be weird- if it were her initials. And I, I thought for sure you would be like, eh, no. And you were like, let's try it. No, I loved it because it represents her. It's her Miranda identity. Hobbs, yeah. M-H. And the interesting thing about Brady Hobbs. And it's really, M-H is before anybody else existed. It's true. Well, you know, and it was so symbolic of her reclaiming herself. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, is, I mean, yeah. that's exactly. the thing that I it's, like about yeah. it. And especially the way of, pans out in the show because she basically goes back to who she was, who she knew before even mm-hmm. Law, before right. mm-hmm. Brady, her before Steve, self. before she was mm-hmm. even co oping that name with anybody else in her family. And then, of course, she puts that on herself, which we don't reveal to the last moment. But the thing that then becomes huge, she's choosing herself as a tattoo, but then she chooses her family over the significant person Mm. in her life, which is Che. So we wanted to show the differences between Che and Miranda. And we thought, what's the strongest thing that could happen that would make Miranda step away from Che in this moment? Right. And it was Brady's pain of Mm -hmm. being in Europe Mm -hmm. alone because his girlfriend broke up with him. And the distance Mm -hmm. from not only her... But the distance from even New York and the distance, he's in Amsterdam, she's in L.A., she's not even in New York. And what he says to her on the line going into the sitcom that is so, I mean, I've seen you all respond to your kids Mm -hmm. in rooms like this. They can really say something that roughs you all up, takes you right out of wherever headspace you're in. But what Brady says to Miranda is... I called dad, but I really wanted you and you weren't there. And that her phone is misfunctioned and Which dysfunctional. Which as a mom is and the worst And then she thing also said, he also says, uh, I wish the car had hit me. And well, that that's is, the big that's moment. That's the mic drop. That was a yeah. big, big moment in the room too, because how much do you take a sarcastic comment like that 
this deeply as uh, the people who do have children in the room seem to take it based on where the world is, where children are. And so Miranda goes full alert. Well, and to to reference Susan's phrase uh, from earlier episodes of this podcast, we wanted to have a moment where everybody's wrong and everybody's right. Because you could argue, Miranda, that's her kid. She had every right to hold on to her phone and to cut out early if he called. You could also argue he wasn't necessarily uh, in danger. This is Che's big moment. Miranda literally wrecked it. I mean, those are both. Okay, well, Miranda didn't wreck it. Her arguments. phone wrecked it. She has every <laughs> but intention. She, she, but she but broke the rules. Well, let's she just. She broke the, the sitcom rules. She also <laughs> broke the marriage rules right. and the mother rules right. and the hetero lady rules. She broke a lot of rules mm-hmm. in in her world. Yes. And uh, she put her phone down her pants. Well, and she was trying to be all things to all people, which I think moms often do. Working moms. And we've tried to be in both places and end up pissing off. And it never works out. And also for the audience, we make sure we also (laughs) threw into the mix that Chase says earlier, he's in Europe with his girlfriend having fun. He's not thinking about you. So it's already like, oh, yeah, he's having fun. So mm -hmm. in Chase's head, it's not a drama. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just a destroyed sitcom, which and is everything to Che. We talked a lot in the room about the differences between them and showing those fault lines mm-hmm. and how they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that then was... the other exciting differences between them and the difference between the style of television that is present in this show, <laughs> because Susan and I have worked on many, many sitcoms with an audience. So the Four idea, cameras. <laughs> the idea that we were actually able to do Che Passa <laughs> and have the amazing Tony Danza who stepped onto that very realistic sitcom set. I mean, we were designing that. I just kept saying faker. Mm-hmm. Faker, <laughs> bigger. Also, and he has a ridiculous joke apron on. It yeah. was every clam that we've ever wanted <laughs> to see. Uh, clam, by the way, is a sitcom writing term. It's when a joke is overused. It's a clam. <laughs> um, um, and little little fun fact for people who like this kind of thing: the sitcom itself, that stage, the interior, and all of that stuff with her phone ringing and the audience was shot in New York. But the line and everything yes. outside coming into the studio was in L.A. on the Warner Brothers lot. So, right. again, it, trippy headspace for But to for write, us. first of all, to write a sitcom and then to have actually those cameras covering it and to see Tony Danza, who walked onto the set and goes, I feel like I'm doing Who's the, the boss. boss. <laughs> like, I feel like I should take a bow. It was so true to him. And then he's doing those very lame sitcom <laughs> jokes. Low-hanging the, fruit. The way they would be done well by an actor. And then the other fun thing to me about this is, from my own personal experience, I've been in many, many sitcoms, is when the writers, <laughs> the writers are so attached to the material that they're standing there. I've actually seen a writer, not me, <laughs> I've seen a writer, not me, on a sitcom, on a sitcom, watching a comic dramatic monologue by one of the characters, crying and mouthing the words. And I was just like, (laughs) that's insanity. (laughs) That they're they're actually going. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, I care. But I'm not. And meanwhile, the actors behind them actually doing the scene and they're just watching the image crying over their sad pathos comedy pathos <laughs> scene. And I was like, we have to have Vivi, mean- who was the showrunner and the co-writer of Che Passa, looking at the screen, emotionally involved and crying about their journey as they funnel it through Che's TV pilot. And then the meta, most meta thing is we're recording it. <laughs> I'm in front of the monitor, <laughs> and I turn around to Elisa, and I go, this is really working. And I'm doing the exact same It's like thing. a mirror within the a mirror. We're doing like to Russian their, doll. To their Russian shitty doll. writers. Was... And then I said, but ours is good, right? <laughs> I mean, it was just like. We weren't crying, but we were no, we laughing weren't, But we were laughing off. at the so laughing. Funny. We were looking away from the thing we had written 
and congratulating ourselves <laughs> the exact same way the clowns <laughs> that we were making fun of were doing it. So that anyway, was our own cream sadly, pie. Sadly, I was that on was... another unit that day, so I got to hear I it. I mean, but we couldn't stop. To us, first of all, the 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 incredible treat of getting to actually do Che Pasa, because you know, like. Just Every calling now it and Chase. then I get a little zeitgeist pop where somebody will say something in the world like it's like a funny joke. And like in a Twitter moment, you'll see something. And when the trailer came out for In Just Like That season two, I saw one person say, but the real question is, what happened to their pilot? Like we would not ever follow that thread. Like we threw it away. Like that's just right, TV writing. Right, right. But like, we went oh, right into that. it. We went right into Che Pasa and more to come about Che Pasa. But... The big thing was Miranda's phone went off, which destroyed the most important thing to Che. And then Miranda says, he's the most important thing to me about Brady. And this, so, this was the first real fight that they have that no one, no one backs down. They each have a strong argument, but we wanted... I, I feel very strongly that they don't. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't think America's going to be on Che's side at all. Actors will. And everybody else, it goes like, as Miranda says, I had my own real family scene. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I totally understand Che. I mean, I'm on the as, record. Yeah, you're right. You, as, you are, you're the one person who's sympathetic <laughs> with that argument. You're like, right. of course. Uh, I, guess. I just want to say, though, something about the process. I mean, the person who said, are they going to follow up with the sitcom? That's how minute our our vision of this world is, this is all real to us. This is how deluded <laughs> right. we are. We make pretend we, we, every we, day. We do everything. Right. We know we what they're gonna eating. We're going to forget that, yeah. <laughs> we know what and the documentary that LTW is doing is about. We know what the sitcom was. We even have lines for the sitcom. All this has to be created. And one of our writers actually, I think, had to write some dialogue oh, yeah. to put on the... On the, on the, the fake pages. The fake pages. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, so. the interesting thing is the sitcom script that they're holding, Che Pasa, is an <laughs> actual script that Rachel Palmer spent time writing those pages. Oh, my God. And the other fun thing about sitcom trivia is notice that how many different color pages there are in the scripts they're holding. <laughs> that's how many because revisions. That's how many, how many revisions. So she's going to be selling that script later. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the reality <laughs> is, I guess At what auction. we're trying to tell the audience is, is this good? <laughs> And well, Miranda says, "You're the last thing after the fight when they sort of heal a little bit and they decide they'll see each other back in New York is, you're, this show is going to be huge, which is all really anybody wants to hear. Right, right. When they're in the middle mm -hmm. of something. Right. And at least Miranda was smart enough to know to say that. <laughs> I but the just... important friend call, talk about Charlotte and Miranda. That's important. Oh, my God. Okay. So when Julie. Miranda, after the awfulness of her phone going off and her getting booted out of there and, and fleeing. Um, that call with Charlotte felt like so many calls my dear friend Elisa and I <laughs> have shared, where one of us is freaking out. The other is both trying to comfort and validate while also giving some guidance and we felt like we 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 were excited to show that Charlotte could do that. That's what really good friends well, do for each other. Well, and not just Charlotte could do that, but Miranda, let's face it, she makes fun of Charlotte a lot. Like, I'm very aware that when we have a coffee shop scene mm. or dinner, it's easy and fun to come up with ways that Miranda sort of rolls her eyes and makes jokes and is mostly... Poking fun. The difference at between their provincialness yeah, and their and, and, the, and their anarchy. style of motherhood and all of that. It was really fun and I think real and validating to show an earnest moment between them where Miranda would call Charlotte because Charlotte is a mom and she's she knows Charlotte's a good mom and she knows that Charlotte will know what to say about this specific situation. I mean, it's nice to see her respect Charlotte's uh, yeah. advice mm -hmm. I, so I deeply in that, that moment. Look, it was the moving, interesting pleasurable. Thing is, yeah. You know, somebody said, uh, all people can't be all things to each other. She doesn't call Carrie in that right. moment. Mm -hmm. She calls Carrie about, should I get a tattoo? Right. Like, you'll tell me what's right, right there. Right. And then she calls Charlotte yeah. because they have yeah. a like thing. Um, I want to just go back and talk a little bit about the very end of the show, which is after Carrie lays down with Lisette, she gets enough... I don't know, strength 
she faces it. She has to go back. Amanda, her uh, her I publicist, her. who knows so much about her, even alludes to the last mm-hmm. phone call that this is the last thing you want to do. And then she says, with the COVID, basically <laughs> saying, <laughs> I know I'm what you're you. doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Carrie knows that she has to do this. And after she lays down with Lisette, she gets up and goes back into the studio and she reads the last line of chapter three, which is a very strong moment. And as I held on to John one final time, the rising water on the shower floor turned the blue of my wedding shoes black. Okay, that's chapter three, done. You got all the pickups, yeah? We're good. Done, done. (laughs) That's all she wrote? You did it, Carrie. Yep. I did it. And she says, I did it. And that's our major accomplishment. And just like that, this is the end of episode three. Thank you so much, Elisa, Julie, and Susan. We'll be back next week to unpack episode four of the series called Alive. Stream new episodes of In Just Like That Thursdays on Max. Listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you. And Just Like That, The Writer's Room is produced by Neon Hum Media for Max. At Neon Hum, Cher Morris is the executive producer. Joanna Clay is the lead producer. Sammy Allison is our head of production. Zoe Culkin is our associate producer. Sam Baer is our engineer. That's it for the show. Thank you for listening.